welcome everyone to GeoHug. Uh, so before we kick off today's session, I'd just like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional lands which we're all coming from today. I live on the beautiful lands of the Gadigal of the people of the Aurora Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future. So I'm really looking forward to the discussions that we'll have on today's panel session about freeing the geos. We have a lovely bunch of rock stars for you today with a diverse range of experience and perspectives who will be sharing their insights on how to free geologists from unnecessary burdens and allow them to do what they do best. So we'll be hearing from Mark Arundel, Phil Gilmore, Paula Delmakowski, Alex Gullius and Michelle Kerry. And I'm so appreciative for all of you for taking the time. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, but yes, to kick this off, we'll be handing the mic over to Mark Arundel, who's the Principal Geologist with INEX Consulting. So thank you so much, Mark. Um, thanks, Jess uh, and Alex for pu uh, pushing to actually um, get this up as uh, a uh, session on GeoHug. Uh, I'll start off with this slide, which is a post that I put up on LinkedIn about two months ago, which is sort of the background uh, for why we're here today. There's been um, quite a lot of views, 88,000, uh, quite a number of people have liked it and uh, applauded, you know, various engagements, and there was over 100 comments and quite a lot of reposts in it. So the reason I put this up initially was because I was hearing a lot about lack of geologists at uni or school students doing earth science, which is what we were talking about last week. And this seemed to be the major focus of tension. And, you know, it, more so it was like this was the only problem that required fixing and this was going to solve the geology problem that seemed to be. But, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be that way from where I'm standing. And perhaps part of that is because I'm a consultant. And I think part of it is there's this real large disconnect between what geologists think we do and what we actually really do. Um, and I'm a bit concerned that I think we've allowed ourselves to actually get quite distracted. So look, maybe some people are happy to be tied to a desk um, and that's you know a useful thing if you're doing resource modeling, but there's a, a lot of stuff I think that's actually interfering um, in our ability to actually do some decent geology. And I don't think this is just a geological issue. Talking to my wife, I think this is more society-wide. So, you know, there's a lot of distractions. Um, and these are some of the things I actually listed in that post in terms of logistics, safety, stakeholders, staff, environment, health, compliance, report riders. Most geos told me uh, with the feedback that I got that 30% is probably about as good as what they'll actually get. Um, someone actually said 5%. Um, the one that shocked me and that was the initial person I asked said 10%. So if we take 30% as a baseline, if geos actually do 60% of their job as geologists, in fact, we've actually doubled the workforce. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do things like logistics and safety. And I think we need to actually have a background and understanding of the processes involved in this but I don't think this should necessarily be our core responsibility. So how do we change? Now, look, I, I don't have all the answers, but I'm just gonna put up a couple of things here. Basically, I suppose what I use in a number of ways. Um, on the, the small scale, on the day-to-day -day thing, I actually ass assess a task before commencing. Um, and I like using the mantra, delegate, don't integrate. So if it's a job that I can pass on to someone else uh, who's probably potentially more experienced at it or better capable of doing it, I'll actually uh, get them to do it instead of myself. In where most people will be coming from, you're going to need some sort of management support to do this. And there's a couple of companies I've spoken to who actually upped the amount of administrative support to actually start working on this. And the first thing you actually need to do with this is to evaluate the workload. You know, what, what are the geos actually doing? And so I divided it into four areas. Um, RO is an, an, an acronym I came up with about half an hour ago. Um, and I've defined it, defining that in as in administration, um, health, safety, environment, and community. 
Um, R for rock thinking, and that includes data processing. And O is on the rocks, which is basically out in the field. So there's four, four areas, I think, that we actually need to look at. And it, it's be good if you, as a geologist or the geologist you have working for you, can start thinking about how they go. And I'm not really into time and motion studies back in the 1920s and Henry Ford, but it's actually not a bad way to actually start looking at your job. Um, look, and as an example, um, this is my current bugbear probably this week and has been for the last month because I've been logging into bed at sands and silts until my brain's gone soft. But core logging is an area where we tend to put the most effort in when the rocks come out of the ground when we've actually got the least data. So we spend an awful lot of time logging drill core before we actually send it to the laboratory, put it through the machine that goes ping so that we actually get some sort of spectral stuff on it. And I'm hoping Michelle comes back on this one later, of course. Um, and then, then it gets palletized and then strapped and put away. Um, whereas I am much more mercenary these days and I'll look at the drill cord, do a quick log, um, send off the material to get cut or sampled or scanned or something like that. And then I come back and actually log the drill cord. Um, the other thing I'd like to mention is support staff and I'm throwing in the, the Mets people here. So, you know, people uh, like Jess and Michelle and Alex's group. Um, I don't think we necessarily value those people, uh, field assistants, uh, people doing landowner stuff and that sort of thing. Um, I find within industry, there's, dare I say, a little bit of lack of respect for people doing this sort of stuff. Uh, and I know that if you run into pe METS people at conferences, I know for many years I used to hide under a rock or find the nearest beer so I didn't have to listen to Jess tell me about the latest redesign of a core tray. Um, however, at a conference I went to recently, I got pinned by someone and actually learnt something extremely useful and I felt like an absolute non for actually behaving that way. So I've changed my behaviour as a consequence of that. So, um, yeah, we need to actually learn from the people, not hide from them. And I've just put Hap up here, who's a Norwegian guy who travelled the world for five years, and he said that working as a fieldy was one of the most enjoyable jobs that he did around the world. And I just absolutely love that. Um, and it'd just be nice to actually see people like that a bit more appreciated. Um, the other big thing I'm um, on about at the moment is less doing, more thinking. Um, and this is actually sort of a bit of a call out to the junior sector um, and just to uh, people who are working in that area, just to ask them what value to get out of put out an ASX release saying we commence drilling. Um, I would love to see people actually drill fewer, better targets. Um, and that sort of comes back into what I've put here is the big picture. Uh, when I actually look um, back in the last 60 odd years, I don't think exploration's changed all that much. I do wonder how conservative we are actually as an industry. Um, and then if we have people who pop their heads up and want to change things, we just get very much into the naysayers very, very quickly and try and run it down. And I do wonder whether this is part of the reason if we're not spending enough geo time, why discovery is actually down. If the geos don't have time to think, they won't have a chance to discover. That'll do me, Jess. Wonderful. I love that. And thanks for the support of METS. I really, I, that was not a paid, <laughs> I did not sponsor that comment. <laughs> but I, no, I appreciate it nonetheless. <laughs> thanks, Jess. I, I know it is METS, but I, I'm actually halfway through, I can't even remember what METS stands for. <laughs> Okay, so you've got a ways to go, Mark. To, <laughs> yeah, all right. All right. Well, thank all you so Michelle. much, Mark. <laughs> I really appreciate it, so thank you. Um, so we're going to hand over now to Phil Gilmore, who is a geoscience consultant for GEMS Geoscience. So thank you so much, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I so got asked to think about my experience and sort of my productive geo time, I guess. And I'm coming sort of from a experience as a mineral explorer, as a regional mapper with government, person who's worked for consulting, now running my business. So, and I'm just sort of thinking back, when, when have I been the most productive? It's, it's when I've had ownership of a project. It's been my little baby. It's been really clear what I've needed to do. I've had a boss who's 
given me the rope to go off and go off on a little tangent, but be able to reel me back in, but also be on hand for advice. I've had colleagues to discuss and lots of arm waving, lots of big ideas, some of them rubbish, some of them good. And also I think is following on from Mark's point of view, they had really good support, for, whether it be from METS or admin or just knowing that the vehicle you're going to take out is, is ready to go for field work. That just saves an enormous, enormous amount of time. Uh, next slide, thanks, Mark. And so I was just sort of thinking about, well, what do I do when I want to get into GEO land? And I, I really do choose what, what's the must-do stuff I've got to do and then what's the nice stuff that I'd like to do. And you've just got to make a choice. There's, there's so much... I suppose like everyone in geoscience, there's so many little rabbit holes to go down. You've got to really think, do I really need to go down that rabbit hole? But if I really want to do some deep thinking, I switch off all my alerts. I switch off my phone. I switch off my emails. Emails will always be there to be answered. So, um, and I block out, I actually block out times in my calendar. But if I find I'm not being productive during that, I'll, I'll go and do those more boring but essential things and come back to that thinking time later. And I, and I think, you know, especially in mineral exploration where we've got licenses that we, we look at, I think you've got to, it just pays to look big, look, look big picture, think about the big ideas and the big geodynamic models and whether they apply to your area and, and just it doesn't, doesn't um, hurt to just be looking at a big map on the wall and having a gaze and, and thinking about things. And I guess we live in an age with a lot of technology, which is fantastic, but um, I also like to sketch things in cross-section or in plan view and think about processes and, and just sort of that's for my mind is, is um, starts thinking about that, those processes, what's happened, how that neural system might have come into, into place. Uh, next slide, next Mark. So some things you can do as a geo, we, Mark just mentioned about the 30% geology. Well, if you work in a nominal 40 hour week, that's 12 hours a week. So when are you actually going to do that? 12 hours it's sort of in my experience not worth doing that as in smaller blocks I think you've got to sort of chunk out those periods of time and I think it's actually really worthwhile keeping a diary of what you're actually spending your time on so that you can look at how you're going to get that 30 percent or hopefully more doing geology work as I mentioned turn off those alerts that's just distractions you don't really need and think about your value again um, we have really really talented uh, colleagues in, in different areas who can help us, whether that's um, you know, land access, whether that's um, making sure our gear's right. Think about what your value is to the company. It's, you're being employed as a geologist, so see if there is someone that can help you with some of those other tasks. Next one. Thanks, Mark. If you're a manager, you've got to trust your geologist. You employed them to be a geologist, so don't micromanage them. If you're a manager, you're a manager. So do manager things, don't do geology things. Let your geologists do that. It sounds so simple, but it happens in every workplace. And I think we as geologists can't help ourselves because the thing that excites us and drives us is the geology, not the, not the management. But it's really, really important that that, that, line, that line is drawn. And I think too, um, there's so much reporting that happens um, across different organisations. Think, well, but why? Why do we actually need to do all this reporting? A bit like the, the example with the ASX before. And again, just thinking about relative value, if you can employ somebody who can take some logistics or whatever pressures off your geologist, then your geologist is going to spend more time doing geology. It's a, it's a no-brainer. Uh, next one. Thanks, Mark. I think there's a lot of things you can do as a team. We, we have, you know, rightly toolbox meetings for safety all the time, but we never seem to take the time to talk geology. It's a pretty simple thing to do. We can divvy up webinars and presentations. There's so much content online these days, particularly after COVID. You could spend your, you could spend every day, all day, just looking at online presentations, which is fantastic, but we don't all need to do that. We can divvy that up and um, disseminate that information. And just to finish, thanks, Mark, the last slide. I mean, why we're doing this is we've just got so many distractions. We've got all this training. We've got all of this data at our fingertips. We also really importantly need to be in the field to check some of those things. We've just got to minimise those distractions. So uh, I'd be interested to see what the other panellists have to say and then the feedback, but hopefully there's a few tips there that will lead to some more thinking time. Thank you. 
thank you so much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. There was some great solutions put forward there as well. So thank you. Um, so now we're handing over to Paula Del McComstey, who's the Director of Community Engagement. So thank you so much, Paula. I didn't, um, I didn't prepare any slides, so you've just got to listen. Okay, so we all know that geology requires people who are scientific, analytical and detailed. So therefore, geology attracts people who can focus on data, think in 3D, spend hours looking down a microscope and days in the field with few people. But I do land access. That's what I'm passionate about. It's probably the most passionate thing I do in my jobs, both a couple of jobs that I have. And land access requires a, a different skill set. I mean, let's get it right. We know most geologists would prefer rocks to people. But fundamentally, land access is about connecting with people and building trust. It's about asking questions and listening, showing empathy, understanding where people are coming from, respecting their viewpoints. It's about being honest. Building a relationship takes time. And not only are we accessing people's land, we're accessing their homes, their families, their livelihoods, their challenges and sorrows. So a couple of weeks ago, I uh, was up, I'm in Ningen at the moment getting land access. So I was up with a different landowner and um, we were talking to her and her husband and she's got terminal cancer. So she was just saying her biggest hope is that she's around in three years time when her daughter graduates from school. So do you think that your graduate geologist could deal with that? If they're new in your business and you send them out to get land access and that's what happens, you spend 15, 20 minutes finding out about the inner workings of people's lives and families, especially when it's something as tragic as that. It's very intimidating negotiating land access. And apart from the fundamentals of connecting with people, I think there are three main requirements in our industry. And the first one, you geologists out there who do your own land access is not pushing your own agenda. I've been pressured by clients to sign a land a land under up um, to access or even just get them to give access without a land access agreement, which now is is um, is against the law. As they uh, and the client believes it's their rights, and they believe the law is on their side. If a landowner meets someone with that attitude they'll more likely be defensive and unresponsive. They can, they can sniff your agenda a mile off. The second thing is don't talk jargon. So I've been out visiting a few times and I've taken the client. The, the client likes to be uh, shown around and brought out, which uh, is a bloody harrowing experience for me because they speak like a geologist. They can't stop themselves. It's taken me years to learn not to speak jargon. I was at a meeting, when I was working at Cadia, I was at a meeting when the Enviros, a long time ago, were informing the near neighbours about the potential aquifer issues that Cadia East may form when they started um, developing Cadia East. All the landowners wanted individual plans that, to know where the water bores were going to be put or the spring sampling sediments. And the senior Enviro was trying to be really helpful. And he stood up there and he goes, no problem. I'll give you all a PDF. And then there's just silence in the room. because. And then one brave farmer said, what's a PDF? So they're all sat there thinking, oh, we're really dumb. Of course, they're not dumb. They just don't know. They didn't know the jargon at the time. And the third thing, you need to be willing to take harsh criticism. That first phone call of a new project still gives me butterflies because you don't know what the response is going to be on the other end. Sometimes you get yelled at, sworn at, blamed for anything and everything. My colleague who I'm training someone up at the moment, he got yelled at for not being able to find the phone number. You can't bloody find phone numbers anymore. They're just not available. But it was his fault that he couldn't find the phone number and he was mad that we dropped in unannounced and didn't call beforehand. So you can't, and you can't help but take it personally. 
it's just sort of a natural thing even though you know it's your job and you're doing the best you can you still take it personally so in conclusion the beginning of land access for any exploration activities is absolutely the most critical part of your process i'm a geologist so i know i love rocks don't get me wrong i love rocks i just love people more Building that trust, showing empathy and respect and giving the landowners time is going to set you up so, uh, for, for future exploration rather than coming in with your own agenda and feeling like you can do anything because you've got the rights. That is just going to put you back potentially to le uh, the legal process and nobody wants that. But once you've built that trust with that landowner, they'll be friends for life. So I'm, I'm very passionate about doing it properly. So um, make sure if you do send out your geos that they are fully prepared for these things. And I am quite happy to share my information. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you so much. There's some great tips and insights in there. So I really appreciate it. Um, so now we're on to the CEO of Core Plan, Alex Gullios. So thank you so much, Alex. Sorry, I'll just unmute. Can you hear me? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thanks, Jess. Um, guys, great to be here. I feel like a little bit of, as an intruder, I must apologize. I'm not a geo. Uh, I come from the tech industry, having, having studied GIS um, before entering the mining industry. But I must say, I've, I've spent my entire life um, working with, my entire career working with geologists. And you know, I, I, very early on, I fell in love with the entrepreneurial spirit of geologists and the, the thrill of discovery and and the fact that they're this this cross between you know geologists and, and artists so um my perspective is more as an observer um and uh yeah really great to be here so um i've been wondering why we need to free the geo and whether they really want to be freed um you know do they actually not mind uh you know doing what they're currently doing now these are sort of the things that we practically here every day in our business and, and we talk to exploration managers and managing directors and geologists of, you know about the way they work and the work that they do right and what we're hearing is that you know somehow you know the, what's happened is that they've become glorified data clerks or data wranglers or um, DBAs and software engineers and all the things that Phil and, and, and Mark sort of alluded to. Um, so I, I find myself wondering sort of how did, how did this happen? Um, digitization in, in the mining industry. If we look back uh, in the early 90s, we were asking geologists to, you know, they were stuck digitizing maps and, and spreadsheets and and as I entered the industry in the early 2000s, GIS was becoming the norm. So we gave geologists computers to lug into the field with the four extra spare batteries. And, uh, you know, unfortunately though, the geological mapping was very, very cumbersome still and logging systems were still very manual and still Excel-based. Um, Really not a lot has changed. Um, and we hear productivity in mining has has really dropped 30%. Um, you know, it's it's no wonder. I mean, exploration is is super complex. Um, it's no longer a walk through the bush and uh stumble upon onto something and boom, here we are. We we found it. I mean, that's that's been done, that's a little bit over. It's much more uh complex and there's a lot more needed to make that discovery today. Um and there's more people and, and stakeholders, both in the field and, and in the office. Um, it used to be that we would give all the technology, all the maps, all the computers, all the GPS gear to the geologists, we'd send them out to the office, uh, to the field, and we wouldn't see them for maybe six weeks. And, uh, and that was it. But now there's more stakeholders in the office and they want more information and they want it in real time. And, and how is, you know, on a, almost on an hourly basis, how are things going um, on the exploration program? There's more and more data. Cumbersome processes have also um, been around like legacy systems and, you know, they've, they've become more cumbersome because we have to maintain the legacy processes. Plus we're reacting to increasing government 
um, regulations, data hygiene, and, and, and so on. Everything seems to fall back on the geologist's role, and that's just becoming more and more difficult than before for them. So it's no wonder these factors are weighing them down and, uh, you know, it's really trapping them in the cells and preventing them from doing what they, you know, they love to do. Um, and they should be doing really interpret the results, you know, validate, but go back in the field and, and do actual geology. Um, so we also mustn't forget where we are at the moment with Gen Z's entering the job market. Um, geology perhaps has a, as a profession has a lot to do to attract these, these new people into the industry. Uh, it's competing against a lot of career paths that are much more technologically advanced, digitized, and uh, yeah, we've we're really got a lot of work to do there. So I'm wondering what the way forward is. Mark, next slide, please. Um, thanks to Hannah a couple of months ago, we, we've got a, one option, we can do nothing, toughen up, give the guys a bit of a emotional support rock and this being geo hug, maybe a big hug. Um, that might work, but uh, yeah, I'm keen to explore how we, we free the geos. I guess from my observation, again, geology is across, it's, it's science and it's art. So in order for these guys to do the art, for that to be able to happen, um, how do we liberate the geologist? And from all that data wrangling and low value uh, work and, and the spreadsheet, um, I guess our philosophy at Core Plan is to enable uh, the geologist through digitization and through automation. That's the key to freeing them from their cells and enable them to do more what they love um, and, and, you know, as well as being out in the field. But I'm super keen to, uh, to hear about uh, what you guys think, especially the attendees and the panelists today, you know, and what the solutions are from, from your side and, and how we can help. Thanks so much, Alex. I um, loved the slides. The Rock is an ongoing joke on Jet Hugs, so it's awesome to see him featured again. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for your perspectives. I really appreciate it. We have one lovely, wonderful speaker left, uh, Michelle Kerry, the Chief of Product Management at Imdex. So thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks, Jess. Um, actually, before I dive into my slides, I wanted to uh, make the point, I don't know, I'm sure many of you saw the the picture that was being put around to advertise today's session. And I must admit, I smiled looking at, at it because I could see pictures of a whole bunch of people who were clearly geologists looking like they were doing geological things. And then there was me with my corporate headshot, all right? Um, I am a geologist. Um, however, I think the, the point I think it's worth making now is that there are uh, lots of different career paths actually for geologists now, um, including career paths that see us working for METS companies. Uh, and there's a lot of smart people now who work for those METS companies. So I think it's really important to, uh, to recognise that freeing the geo means lots of different things now and can mean lots of different career paths. So if we go to the first slide, uh, this is one that I've used lots of times, mostly because I just really like the Pierce Brosnan picture, really, I'm not going to lie. Um, I mostly wanted to use it today, though, to talk about all the things that geos aren't. I quite often use it to talk about what geos want to think that they are. Um, Alex has already done a really good job about talking about one of the we are nots, which is around data wrangling. So I, I won't really um, cover any of those points again, really other than to reiterate and to make the call out that METS companies or dirty suppliers, as Mark might uh, have called us before he was reformed, uh, do have solutions now. Technology does have solutions to a lot of those data wrangling problems. So really, why don't, how do we find ways for people to embed them into their workforce? Um, the other thing that's not on here is a picture of a geo trying to drill a hole. Now, I think we all know that this is a pretty clear-cut line as well between drillers and geos, but actually the call-out I want to make here is we're having a skills shortage problem, but actually so is the drilling industry. They're finding it harder and harder to find experienced people to man those juries. And what that's meaning is you're starting to get this funny air gap between us, right, where Drillers maybe don't have the experience and exposure that they used to, so they might not quite know what to do. Geologists increasingly might not quite know what to do either. And so that can, that can lead to some, I think, quite interesting situations in the field. And, you know, I think it's this call out that fixing, freeing up geologists is more than about us. 
And really the, the lead down point from that is I think it's really important for us to make the distinction that we don't want to do lots of logistics, right? A lot of the other panellists have been really good at talking about all the things that we get stuck doing. But there's a bit of a distinction here between one role that I think is still ours, which is around leadership on that drill rig or leadership out in the field. And I kind of call it being who's the CEO out here. And I think that that is the geologist. We're the ones that have got the vision, you know, about what good looks like. What's the outcome that we want from this drilling program? That does sit with us. So, but how do we do that, right? That's, as I said, that's a vision piece. That's a leadership piece. It doesn't mean getting caught in logistics. It doesn't get caught in the day-to-day. To stretch the analogy, that's a COO. That's a different role. So I think it's really interesting for us to explore how we show that leadership around getting what we want, but not get caught in the day-to-day. We'll go to the next slide. And yes, Mark, you'll be reassured that I have gone here. Now, I typed in robot geologist into to Google. I shouldn't use chat GPT, obviously. And this is what I got back. And really, what I'm, the point I want to make here is, what are we freeing ourselves up to do? Do we really want to free ourselves up to be data collectors? The reality is now that there are lots of sensors that can help with that. Now, to Mark's point, though, I don't, I'm not advocating that we use sensors to replace geologists entirely in the logging process for example, but I am advocating that why aren't we allowing sensor data to be collected, aggregated, turned in to answer products, and then use those to guide the way a geologist is doing their logging. Um, Mark asked me offline whether I was considering, you know, replacing the Steve Beresfords of this world. Now, for a start, Steve's my husband. So (laughs) although I might want to replace him in the dishwashing duties, it's not probably not uh, a good thing for my marriage if I um, get him replaced. But I do, I do think it's important that there are geologists in the field, but th- th- they're doing interpretive work there, right? Not necessarily data collection. And, you know, there's a distinction here that I really think we need to be clear about. And, yeah, brutally, this might mean that there are less geologists over time. There are geologists that sometimes are doing really pretty, pretty unpleasant jobs um, on a lot of drill programs. We just have to embrace that, right? I think it's about freeing geos to have good jobs, not freeing geos up to do data collection. Okay, that's me. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank you to each and every one of you. Um, I really, really appreciate it. So we're gonna start um, opening up the floor now. I've got some great questions coming through on the chat. If anyone has thoughts on why don't we employ more project managers to do the project and program management rather than wasting the geos? Would anyone like to kick off with their thoughts? Oh. Bill, go for it. I think it, I think conceptually that can work, but um, you have to employ the right project manager. Um, I've seen cases where projects have to ad- adhere to the project management and that's a disaster for everybody. So uh, just a little word of caution, I guess. Yeah, I'd tie this to my CEO and COO analogy, mm-hmm. right? But if the geo's in charge, then, then I think that idea that they have a, a strong right hand to, to make things work. Yeah. Any other comments on this one? I, I think part of the problem with project management role is we don't have people who are uh, have got a, a pipeline or a career path to upskill, and where do they go next with that as well? Um, and I, that that to me is a fundamental failing industry wide. There used to be take courses that were facilities. Phil's dogs really enjoying today, I can tell. Um, you know, but they, they seem to have dissipated, um, and it's. I'm disappointed the industry actually hasn't recognised this and uh, smacked the professional organisations about the head with a wet fish to actually get something like this up and running again. Um, Yeah, look, you know, uh, there was a comment that someone made that a a great field is worth their weight in gold. I'm 100% behind that as well. So we we can't materialise a project manager out of nowhere. They have to get trained. They have to have experience. And then they have to see a path forward because I think a lot of them see it as a dead end job. And um, this is why I'm talking about value and respect. Um, I don't think 
me as a geologist historically, and as, as you know, I was saying before, I'm only starting to wake up these things now, to wake up to these things now. We, we actually need to do this. Um, otherwise, the whole industry is declining. Michelle touched on drilling, and I think that's a perfect example of where, and I don't see it as an air gap, it's like a vacuum basically developing between the two things. And the big thing for me is it costs money because inexperienced drillers, inexperienced geologists coming together will make mistakes that actually cost money. The more thing I'm concerned about is people will actually get hurt by that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was a great comment um, by Michelle before of um, free the geo can look really different for everyone and there's a lot of different career options around um, these days. So this one is with the hot topic of climate change, what can geologists do to get involved and what career options are available? Does anyone want to comment on that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll go first. And I think this is, I think this is a question I get asked quite a bit, actually. I think it's really interesting because I think, you know, you can, as a geo, you have the ability to go and work now for, for companies that are mining for critical metals. And that's definitely a way that you can tie your, your job and what you do day to day to a purpose. And I think that's going to be increasingly important. I don't know, I'm starting to hear stories of Geo saying, actually, I don't want to work for a gold company, for example, because it's harder to make that link to purpose. I also think that this is a place, again, where mining tech companies do have a bit of an interesting pathway to offer. A lot of the things that we do, you know, really where, you know, we're about improving the decisions Geos make, we're about improving productivity. But in the end, a lot of those are really serving this idea of, making the industry better so we can find more stuff and mine stuff in a more effective way. So again, you can really link through to a, a purpose that's pretty clear around, you know, making, making the world a better place. I think, so part of this is about lots of geopaths have that link through. How do we make sure that people can see it? And then I think how you live it every day, how you make sure that it's real and not just something that someone says on a piece of paper. Yeah. Can I add to that, Jess? Please do. So um, in my world, I know I think I should do everybody's land access here, um, but uh, it doesn't matter when you get your access, everybody usually comes in contact with a, the landowner or some of the locals at any time. And so therefore it's our responsibility to talk about the future and what we're doing and the fact that we're looking for the metals that are going to help us get to 2050 decarbonisation, which, of course, we're not going to, but let's not talk about nuclear just quite yet. But anyway, um, and so the other day I've been trying to get hold of this one landowner and they've been ignoring me, and I know why, because they're new, they're scared, they don't understand anything. And finally, I sort of got round to meeting them and when I explained that that story you know we're here we're looking for renew most people now in New South Wales especially are looking for renewable and we can use what we're mining in hard rock for the future which is a great story and so when we had this chat this lady said okay I understand it it's not about my husband and I this we're part of a bigger picture here and um and therefore I I get it I understand and I was like wow that's the first time I've ever sort of been able like they're already got this bigger picture in the back of the mind and now they're part of it so it was a very successful uh signing so but like every geologist may meet a landowner or a neighbor and we've all got that same story we should be telling yeah that's a great example thanks Paula did anyone else have any comments on that before we move to the next one look I, I thought what Michelle said was great you know we I, I let, it's Pete Betts, I think, made the, the comment about that the mining industry loves showing the abattoir. Um, mm. we, we don't show the end product and that sort of stuff. Um, and part of that, I think, is the decision makers on the ads are the people who are senior executives of the company. So the Minerals Council comes up with two alternatives and the guys who work in industry, oh, I like that one. That, that one's more relatable to me. But that doesn't matter, you know, it, our, our consumer, if you like, or the target audience don't care about, you know, the latest CAT 789B truck going up the hill with hydrogen power. Um, my children don't care 
what metals are in their smartphone. They just want the smartphone to work. We, we're looking so poorly, we just need to actually change. I still I find if someone asks me what I do, and I say I'm an exploration geologist, and I may have said this last week, but you know, I, I may as well be an undertaker. Climate um, criminal. I get called a climate criminal ooh. when the kids at school find out. It's, yeah, so, you know, we, we actually need to change um, the way we actually talk about ourselves and that sort of stuff. You know, and future-facing metals, um, I still have a little titter in the back of my throat every time I hear that sort of stuff, but maybe it'll become acceptable in time and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, look, you know, maybe we just need to not make as much noise and just get on and do the job in some ways as well, but... Yeah, just choose the appropriate time and when we can actually talk about things. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> Mark, you say 30% is the norm for time on rocks. Does this include desktop geology, such as modelling, EDA, GIS, or just direct rock type time, like logging and mapping? Um, yeah, great question. Um, I just looked at EDA and it reminded me that, um, I don't know if Michelle saw, but there were two different definitions of METs came through sure. in the chat before. I know. So I feel like really got a brand, the branding problem, right? Uh, yeah. Aaron was correct, by the way, if anyone wants to know. That is the official death. And, and I know both of them actually work in Mets, so that, that was, um, <laughs> that's just beautiful. I know I was going to say one of them, but I didn't want to make myself look dumb, so I'm glad that um, someone put their hand up and did it for me. Thank you very much. Um, EDA is exploration data analysis or... Um, what I like to refer as gassing, but anyway, that's another topic for another day. 30% um, is total of everything. There, there are a few companies that are actually working on this at the moment, and um, uh, I have seen some things that some sites actually have the on the rocks at 30 Um However, that is the exception rather than the rule. The, the amount of logistics, report writing, uh, not necessarily stakeholder engagement, because I think we're actually starting to wake up to that, is coming through. And the companies that I've been speaking to, you know, they, they love this idea of delegate, don't integrate. And when you actually look at the integration that people are doing and, um, you know, the... Alex is just going to love it. I've got a wad of plots here on my desk with the surveys as well. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm living the dream of the paper nightmare of having to scan it. Um, and particularly these small little ones don't scan particularly well, which unfortunately um, I've still got to pull one out of the scanner <laughs> after we get, get off. Did they get faxed to you in the first place just to really round it out? <laughs> Okay, let, let me tell you my fat <laughs> story. Um, the, the first time I saw, uh, I, I did a vacation work at BHP Petroleum in, this, this shows my ancestry, in 1984, 1985, and they, they were drilling a hole off the northwest shelf. The, the log from the drill hole was coming through in real time to the fax machine, um, as the hole was being drilled. That was 40 years ago in oil and gas. Um, you know, we are, uh, all I see with the um, number, a lot of the technology that we're doing is what I call slimlining. Um, having worked in potash and oil and gas, I see the machines that they actually have. And we are so behind with our slimlining. Basically, it's not funny. It's a major challenge for industry. Um, and I think that's where, you know, and this is where the, you know, uh, drilling undercover actually needs to have those tools in operation before we're actually going to make an impact in that regard. But I'd, yeah, I'd like Alex to comment on that with the, the well, reams of paper that you guys must see that you can actually smack out with a, a um, and I just love it when I see a driller with an iPad in the field. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we, we also should probably uh, look at, you, you mentioned the word facts which anyone you employ now will have never heard of before and not, not know what it is. And then you also mentioned the word scanner, which if I ask any of my team to do, they don't know how to use it. 
<laughs> um, so, you know, that's that's the, the the generation that we're employing now in, into the industry. And so you, you, you've, we've got a real chasm there. Um, and, you know, there's this idea of this 30% really doesn't sit right with me because, you know, geologists are supposed to be specialists, not generalists when touching a million different things. So we've got to really choose where 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 they're going to be generalists because it is a complex role and you know they need to look at the rocks they need to know geochem geophysics alteration they need to know about economic geology they need to know about everything but they're also asked to do this you know back to this project management style of of everything else around it and uh you know that that's probably in, left in in someone else's hands you know um i think a, you touched on it, a great fieldy you know, should be telling you what to do um, and uh, and running the show. That's that they're a project manager. They're uh, they should be right. They should be empowered to run the show. And uh, and then then you really can wander off and look at the rocks and think about things completely different. Um, that thirty percent is uh, is shocking. I've um I've told a story and it's actually it's one of the stories of people that are less than the ten percent and it made me think of something that you mentioned, Phil. Was that one of the other weird things that was causing people to spend less time doing geology was that the, the exploration manager sitting back in the office wanted the core log every morning by 8.30 a.m. for them to have a look at with their cup of coffee and, and to start their day. And what that was causing for the geo in the field was this kind of like this thing where it's like, oh, well, I have to be up at seven and then I have to finish my logging by eight so that my, my exploration manager can see it. So you're actually also just compressing the time to do the work. Oh. Oh. Back into a tiny portion of the day. You're like, that's actually causing people to not, even if they had the time, potentially not being given the time to do it. And, and it's also the, so probably the most important thing we do is we spend all this money drilling, all of this time yeah. getting land access, getting the logistics right, and then you're rushing you the, rush the, log. the logging of the core. Yeah. yeah. And crazy. to my point, and you, you don't even use data to inform it and, you know, all these things, right? Like, yeah, why have we just rushed the thing that's the most important? Yeah. Because we're, we're still stuck in the 50s and the 60s in the way that we approach the exploration. Yeah. Mm. Hello. Um, I'm not sure if everyone's aware um, of all the, the drilling that Minex CRC has been doing. It was coming out of the DET CRC. So um, I'm not totally all over slimline um, drilling, but it's pretty interesting to see sort of real time um, geochem, real time petrophysics, all that sort of stuff coming out now. Um, but I guess, you know, you, there's, there's proxies to do that as well with, with conventional drilling. If, if we've got portable XRFs, we've got. Yeah. Mag sus meters, all of that, capture that data, and, and, and Alex and Michelle, you'd be all over this. But you know, getting that as, as quickly as possible next to the drill log, so that you can be drilling, having that drilling, and then looking at the core of the chips with all of that information to help you. It's, it's honestly more around yeah workflows to to make that easy to do, so you don't end up. I don't know. We we use this picture sometimes internally, where you've got some poor geo with uh, two machines that go ping, no three machines that have gone ping, right? Uh, an NIR, an XRF, and a mag sus meter, all, and then, then just a lot of data and a lot of mess. But, you know, that's just that's just workflow and tech because you're right, actually, the things that do it, and, of course, you could replicate that effect now with, you know, one of the many scanner units that are starting to appear that make it a bit more of an integrated effect. But, yeah, you know, these are things that could be done. We're not doing them very often, but they can be done, right? And that Minix CRC stuff is really exciting, right? With the Call Tube Rig program, we, we sponsor some of that. And yeah, that is starting to get closer to these oil and gas analogies where people are putting sensors, um, not just down the hole, but actually um, behind the bit so that in mm. real time, you can be starting to collect um, geophysics data to inform what the rocks are. So that, that's, that's a very oil and gas-like step into the future. Hey, um, I've got a little tip. I, maybe everyone's been doing this and I'm very slow to the party, but I've got a colleague at Geoscience Australia who takes half core and scans it on a flatbed scanner. I never thought of doing it. It's brilliant. Yeah. Put away your cameras, just get a, get a $40 scanner, plug yeah. it into your computer. The detail he gets is amazing. Yeah. That's really cool. It's really cool. Hmm. Um, there seems to be a lot of people getting disenchanted with geology positions as they advance. 
How can we find more career options without leaving the industry? Come and work for me. <laughs> well, can I can I just make a comment and, and this is going to be different across the board but more and more you see geologists start to go up their career and the the obvious path to go is into management and then a lot of geologists get into management and go oh my god what have I done and then it's actually hard ridiculously hard to go back um, mm. down to what's seen as a a, a, a lower a lot of position, people. but is actually probably much more important than the person um, who's in that management chair. And so, you know, hopefully there's more and more recognition across the industry of rewarding people for their technical excellence and in terms of remuneration and conditions rather than just going up a ladder. Um, it's a very public service thing, of course, but hopefully in industry, um, there is that recognition and hopefully if there is that that stops people from getting disenchanted with geology because they will be spending more time doing geology such a tough one because I, I think people have been saying this needs to happen and I reckon if you asked a HR department they'd tell you no no look here's our technical stream that's that's equivalent to our management stream but it, it doesn't seem to stick with people and I think the other thing that happens Mark and I'm sure you'll comment on this is that people decide to become consultants instead right that that's mm -hmm. that's sort of the other way that people go you know what I'm going to step out of the the corporate stream where I feel like I'm not I'm invalid if I'm not a manager and I'm going to be a consultant instead I this is such a tough thing it, it, it is a great topic and pretty important um a lot of the time, I'd say for me, Michelle, the decision was made for me. Um, it's called redundancy. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's I, I look, you know, I'd, I've been made redundant multiple times and I would still say each time it was the best thing that ever had happened to me um, because of the opportunities that it actually offered. But to make the step outside the... Um, the big company and having worked for a number of big companies, um, but uh, one in particular that probably doesn't need mentoring, but anyway, most of the guys that I worked with there had only worked for that big company. And mm -hmm. I used to call them Shawshanked um, because that was the only home that they ever knew. And so to make the step outside, that was a really, really big thing to do. Mm -hmm. To make a step out as a consultant to actually establish your name, um, is very different, uh, very difficult. Um, I know, yeah, from personal experience with Paula, for her to go out and set up a land access thing, you know, that was a big, brave thing to do because guess what? No one does that, you know? Um, and, the, you know, do, is there actually a need? But, you know, there needs to be the perceived need for that in some ways with that as well. Um, but, yeah, the, the there is a lot of actually opportunity in there. Um, and... From what Phil said, um, you know, in terms of going up the slippery ladder, definitely management is still where you, you are going to get the bigger bucks. Um, I have been up that ladder. I have got out as a consultant. I've gone back in and been involved in junior exploration companies and MD CEO roles, and I'm quite happy to step in and step out of that in many ways. But I know now where I'm working at the moment and um, as my one of my dear daughters said to me, you are in the twilight of your career. So it's given me this great opportunity to actually stick the, the, the boot in as well at things that I'm seeing, because I'm not representing anything or anyone at the moment. I'm just had, had a fantastic year, uh, time working in the industry for a number of years and worked with some amazing people and still are getting in there. But I'm, I'm just actually want to see things actually improve a lot. And the ability of some of the tech stuff that um, I see Index, Data Rock, um, Core Plan doing, I just want to see that a little bit more integrated in the workflow for, for companies to actually start appreciating how they actually um, have created the stills, skills crisis by loading geos in you know, I don't want to go back to the 90s where we had the drafts people and the, the typing pool and multiple office managers. But I think because expiration is stuck in this mentality of operating in the 50s and the 60s, and unfortunately, Cam's image of Perth's coming back into my mind time and time again. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we actually need to 
sit down and start again and look at how exploration actually should be run. And maybe with a white sheet, we may see that it actually should um, be structured a little bit differently than the way that we're running it at the moment. Yeah, I think it'd be a really, really interesting way to tackle it, right? Because you know, I think one of the challenges we have trying to introduce new things is, yeah, we're trying to shove new things into an old workflow and it doesn't work. So you almost have to, and we know, by the way, that we probably have to help with this sort of thing now. It's like, yeah, what if you stood all the way back, what would the core shed look like today? How how would you actually run this to, to get a better outcome and a better outcome for geos and actually a better outcome for the, the resource company in the end? Yeah. So I think it's a really I mean, it, thought exercise. Yeah, a constant source of frustration for me is that people tell me, oh, I guess is a geochemist's tool. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sort of like I've got to get the, the big rubber hammer out from 1993 when Simon first wrote it under DOS and say, no, it is not. It's a tool for geos to look at their geochem data. And that's, that's where one of the issues actually is. We, there's a perception of what certain things actually are. And I think, I think that's why groups like... Yeah, when Sorry. Simon and then Dave envisaged that thing, if you ask them what they think they were doing, yeah, they were making geochemistry accessible to geologists. That, yeah. that, that's actually the philosophy that sits behind it. Yep. This and on the work oh, sorry, keep going. I mean, uh, just touching on the workflow things, you know, there's a lot of legacy systems and, you know, don't be afraid as geos to go, let's just throw it out. You might find that it's, you know, and, and look at, as Michelle says, you know, a new, a, a new workflow because sometimes we're holding on to things thinking, oh, no, no, we can't, we've got that, you know, that's going to cost us a lot. Sometimes putting something new in, it's change, but um, it's not, not necessarily more expensive. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all everyone's time for coming along today. Thank <sighs> you.